then just jump into because we have a lot of new participants uh and we would like to hear a little bit more about you again yes absolutely absolutely and actually i have a slide my first slide is all about my background so i explain it in a little bit more detail because that's always of interest for people who were not born in the us who arrived here in silicon valley and did something um, I think it's always interesting. You have multiple ways into Silicon Valley, into this world of venture capital or corporate venture capital. My way is not the way of an entrepreneur. So it's interesting because it might be different from some other people that you have uh, discussed. So what I can do is share my screen and uh, I can, if you don't mind, I will, uh, I will do that. I know you have a translation of my slides but I have slightly reordered them, okay? So they're in a slightly different order for today, uh, just because some of you might have heard it last week, and I wanna make it a little bit more interesting for you as well. So it should be interesting for people who were there before and interesting for new people. So let me, start, yeah. let me start by sharing my screen and uh, let me know if you see it. Yes, we see it. Very Thank good. You, Mark. Okay, perfect. So let me make a start on uh, this uh, on this little story, starting with uh, a bit selfish, starting with myself. <laughs> so um, this is a bit of a busy slide, but it explains what I've done in my career and how I arrived in the U.S. and what I've done in the U.S. in Silicon Valley and what I'm doing now. So. I'll try and do it in one minute or a bit more than one minute, but not too long. Um, I was born in Paris. I was born in, in Europe and I started by being a, an engineer. I was a, a technical guy when I do, did my um, education uh, in France. And um, the fir my first job was for an American company called McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell Douglas is a, an avionics company. They had a lot of business doing uh, aircrafts uh, in the US, but they had an international network, um, uh, which at the time was not yet internet, it was pre-internet. And they had uh, created that network to do uh, to transfer files from every, everywhere in the, in, in the world where they had presence. And I started working with them doing software development, but very quickly I realized that I liked software development, but I liked what my the guy next to me was doing he was spending his time on calls every day and visiting customers, and he was helping customers with their particular network problems. And those customers were enterprise customers typically, and they were trying to do file transfer for themselves on that same network, because this network that this company had created, they had opened it up to a lot of other companies. So that's how I got more interested into the um, business side of the, uh, of, of the company rather than purely technical. And um, throughout my career in Europe, I did um, solution design for customer. I was then the head of the uh, solution design team, then the head of bid management. And then I moved on to marketing and I moved on to corporate development. And corporate development is when you create those alliances with local players. Um, and particularly the alliances for us were joint ventures uh, with, with a European company. So, I became very familiar with the world of creating joint venture and alliances in my organic years in Europe. And this is how BT, which acquired this company, um, at the end of my 10, 12 years of doing this, the board of BT and the CEO of BT said, hey, Jean-Marc, you sound like you're a good guy when it comes to finding partners and finding alliances. I'm gonna send you to Silicon Valley because we need to grow our innovation now in Silicon Valley. You're gonna find the more interesting startups. And I said, well, that's a good in interesting idea. In fact, it's an idea that I had suggested to him. So he was playing it back to me, I was happy. But um, importantly, I said, look, I mean, the one thing to do in Silicon Valley is you have to have money to invest. So please give me money to invest. And I asked for 500 million and he gave me 250 million to invest. <laughs> $250 million, and I arrived in Silicon Valley in 2000, sent by BT Corporation, UK-based, uh, in order to invest in startups here in the US. So it was very, very interesting because I spent the decade between 2000 and 2010 
running a corporate venture fund. And we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about that more because I have a lot of experiences about what it means to be a corporate venture fund as opposed to being a VC, a proper venture capital firm. Um, it's very different and I'll give you some examples of what that means. Um, then after 10 years, in 2010, we had made investments, we had made follow-ups, everything was going fine. We didn't have any company that went bankrupt. We had some companies that had a couple of exits, but it was not really making a big difference to the company. The, the company that sent me is a company that makes about 30 billion of revenue. And you know the best exit I had was 55 million, right? So, and it, frankly, it doesn't make much of a difference when you have 55 million plus or minus on a company that has 30 billion of revenue. So I decided, okay, let me focus on purely the technical, finding the right technical uh, partnerships and bring that to the business units, to our uh, enterprise and consumer business units so that they can launch better products in the UK market and make a difference that way rather than through investing. So that was the part of my career which is called open innovation on this slide. And um, I did this, so in total that was another 10 years, so total was 20 plus years in that company. And uh, I decided last year that it was enough that I had done what I needed to do with this company and I started moving my attention to other companies outside and now I work with startups a lot. I work with entrepreneurs trying to find their way into the market. During this whole 20 years of me in Silicon Valley, every year I, my team and myself, we met with about three to 400 startups every year. And every year we had a deal with between five and 15 startups. So I've got quite a good experience of how this works between entrepreneurs and corporations. Um, and corporations with investment capital or without investment capital. So these are the things that I want to talk about today. Um, today I work with entrepreneurs, but I work also with large corporates and I work with universities. I do a lot of uh, co-teaching and uh, guest lecturing in, in universities worldwide. Okay, right. Let me move on to the first thing, which is about dispelling a bit of a myth about Silicon Valley. And I'm sure that by now in the curriculum and what you've heard on these conferences, you know a lot of things about Silicon Valley. And you know Silicon Valley is a really good place for entrepreneurs. This is still true, by the way, because there's a lot of people at the moment here in the US and elsewhere that say, oh, Silicon Valley is over. You know, with the COVID pandemic, everyone is going to be working from home and Silicon Valley no longer exists and it's going to be dismantled and that's complete bullshit. Um, Silicon Valley is alive and well. It's actually very strong. Uh, there's more uh, innovation and more money in Silicon Valley at the moment than there has been in a long time because no one knows what to do with their money. When there is capital available, it doesn't yield anything at the moment because the interest rates are so low um, and also regular companies have very, very much a difficult time at the moment, so they're not giving a lot of dividends. So a lot of the money is coming into tech and it's converging here into Silicon Valley to be invested into tech. Uh, for those of you who know or might be interested in one of the newer phenomena of Silicon Valley, there's something new this year which has taken an enormous amplitude this year. It's called SPAC. SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Company. I uh, encourage you to have a look at what that means, SPAC, SPAC, Special Purpose Acquisition Company. And you'll understand why Silicon Valley is still very much at the center of things and there is very much of an intention for people to invest here and create innovation here. But what I want to tell you on this slide is that there's something that you know already about Silicon Valley. It's very good for entrepreneurs. This is where you want to go if you have a good idea. This is where you can become rich, being an entrepreneur or being a VC. Absolutely, it's still the gold rush for Silicon Valley, <laughs> even today. Uh, but something that is more interesting is the reason why it's so interesting. It's not for the first step, you know, from entrepreneur with a good idea to a startup. It's for the second step. And the second step is, from successful startup to successful company and scale up. So that's what Silicon Valley is very good at stimulating that. And there's three or four reasons why Silicon Valley is so good at this. Well, number one is the VCs have more patience and a longer range 
mindset than in many other places, um, especially compared to Europe. Uh, VCs here understand what a platform two-sided marketplace model is. They know that if you have a good idea, you need to invest for a period of time to create a, um, a large number of users, a large number of customers, a large number of visitors, unique visitors, and then you can start monetizing it with sellers and buyers or viewers and advertisers. They know this two-sided model very well. And um, they know that it requires an investment phase and they're ready to make that investment over periods of multiple years if, if it's needed in order to create that. And you know that's how we get these fantastic two-way marketplaces, the Airbnbs of this world and the Ubers and the Lyfts of this world and, and, uh, you know, and formerly PayPal and Amazon and all these good things. These are all the same idea of having two-sided marketplaces. So they know very well that model and this is the place where they're the smartest creating those models. Now, the second reason why it's a good place is because there is talent here and talent to be able to scale the IT and particularly the cloud IT instances to a scale which is pretty much unheard of anywhere else. I mean, you probably know that Google has eight or nine, I don't know, eight, I think, products that have more than one billion unique users. Um, you know, for an IT platform to have 1 billion unique users, it takes specific skills to scale that up in a non-stop architecture, right? So um, those skills are available here in Silicon Valley. There are people that have gone through all these different platforms, engineering teams, software engineering teams that have done that. There are a few places where you have those skills as well in Europe, in Russia, and also in China, particularly in China. But those places, there's not many people who know how to do that. So there's a big reservoir of these people here in Silicon Valley, and that is what is so attractive for the VCs as well. Now, the third reason is that VCs play the role of human resource department of Silicon Valley. So they know where to place the right person with the right skill at the right time in the development of a startup. And that's quite important because it's one thing investing in a company, but it's another thing making it grow to a scale up. And in order to do that efficiently, you need to know when you need to place that very good guy who's very good at international business development because he's done it in three different companies before. And you know where to find it because where to find that person because that person has been on a number of your investments before. So VCs orchestrate these things. I mean, they help place the right skills at the right time, not just IT, but also business development, also you know, customer service and customer success, also UI and design people. They have this Rolodex full of good people, so they place them in the right time. And finally, in Silicon Valley, you have exit potential because there are all the fangs of this world are waiting with big jaws ready to gobble up some of these very interesting new models, and they are flush with money. They have a lot of cash and a lot of shares. So they have access to capital like nowhere else, right? So it's really interesting for all these reasons, and people do not necessarily talk about these things when they talk about Silicon Valley. So I won't, I'm not trying to oversell Silicon Valley to you, but I want it to be clear in your mind why it is so successful and why it's not going to go away as quickly as people think. Okay. So this is, I promised I would tell you about my corporate venture capital days when I was investing $250 million in startups. And I have a lot of uh, good and bad experiences about this. Um, and the bad experiences are not about it's bad to be a VC, is as an entrepreneur, you need to be careful about the difference between a VC and a corporate VC. So let me explain that. So a corporate VC invests the money of the company. And the company is not like a VC. A company typically has an industrial need. In my case, the company BT, British Telecom, that was really all about telecommunications. It's really about creating networks and you know, charging people a monthly fee for networks. So it's a stable business. People, you know, people continue paying their monthly bills regularly but it can have ups and downs, right? So uh, especially in 2001, when the first internet bubble burst, the whole world was in a bit of a trouble and including the company. 
And even though I started the fund and invested in companies in 2000 and 2001, in 2002, it became a little bit more difficult for me to invest because the company was in a bit of a downturn and uh, the money that was set aside for me to invest, all of a sudden it was very contended. There were a lot of other people needing that money for very urgent things in the company. So it was becoming a lot more difficult. So sometimes, you know, corporate venture capital people, there are waves when the company is going well, they invest a lot. And when the company is not going so well, it's more difficult for them to follow up on their investments. But guess what? This is when exactly when the entrepreneurs need the money the most. When things are going well, okay, they've got money, it's all fine. When things are not going well, like today, like in 2009, like in 2001 and two, that's when you need to have a stable investor behind you that can absolutely follow up on their investments. And sometimes corporate venture capital guys are not as good. I'm not saying all the time, I mean, most corporate venture capital guys protect their uh, capital, but sometimes they default. So sometimes they're not able to follow up because it comes at a time when the company cannot uh, spare you know, X amount of millions on corporate venture funds. So be aware of that as the, you know, the, the, the reliability of, a, of an investor is important over the long term. The other thing that you might think when you are uh, you know, courting or asking money from a corporate venture fund, so you go to Next47, which is the Siemens, for instance, uh, venture fund, you say, you know what, if I get money from these guys, I'm going to get a contract with Siemens, that's sure. Well, no, it's not sure. It's not sure at all. Uh, because, the, in fact, in my case, and it's the, it's the average, um, the fact that a corporate venture capital invests in your company only converts in about 30%, one out of three cases where you manage to also have a commercial contract with the parent company. Uh, it's not all the time. It can happen, but it's not guaranteed. So a contract is not guaranteed, and that's a misconception that many people have when they knock on the door of, these corporate venture capital guys. Um, also, there's another little problem, and I'll finish on this one, which is um, corporate venture capital guys like to give you advice as to what you should do with your company. But the advice is always very self-serving. So if they start using your technology, they will give you advice that consists in making the best use of your technology inside their scenario, their company. And you become very, very good at delivering a solution for their needs, but not necessarily for the rest of the market. So it can be detrimental. Sometimes it's perfectly okay because their needs are identical to everyone else's, but sometimes it's not the case and their needs are very, very specific. So it tunes you or it forces you or it you know, coerces you to do something which might not serve the entire market and become more specialized in one customer and that's not always good right so so just be aware of these differences and there are good sides there are bad sides about um you know getting money from a corporate venture capital as opposed to venture capital as opposed to angels as opposed to government grants right government grants are very good because it's kind of free money uh, but it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get a lot of help whereas vcs are going to help you Corporate venture capital guys are going to try and help you. Okay, so that was my little story on corporate venture capital. I'm going to share with you this slide, and it's full of text, and please don't read it now, but um, hopefully you will get it as part of your pack, and uh, you can read it later. I'll just make a few points. This is the VC checklist that I use, and I was a corporate VC, so I always asked those questions from the companies that pitched to me. Um, and I heard Anastasia talk about, you know, pitch due diligence and then, you know, term sheet and then investment. Um, that's the only thing I understood, by the way, in the, in the little uh, uh, section before, uh, before me. But um, the... Um, it's good uh, that all the terms are international, right? So you can pick yes, up... Yes, yes, the... yes. <laughs> uh, I was pleased to hear yeah, a couple please. of English <laughs> Exactly. But the... Uh, hashtag. So... Hashtag uh, deal room. <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. So this is what I use with my um, the startups that, that pitch to me. And I use this as my checklist to make sure that I had asked all the important questions, right? And the questions are classified in three groups. There's why, 
there's what and there's how. So, and the why is probably the most important. The why is the purpose. Um, and the why helps you understand whether if the company has trouble, they still have a long-term view. They have a guiding line. They have this North Star that is guiding them, right? So that's a very important one to test. And the main thing is to understand what exactly is the problem that you are solving. And the problem that you're solving as an entrepreneur needs to be a real market problem. Uh, one of the things I see a lot, especially from entrepreneurs that come from the corporate world, um, is my problem is I don't sell enough of my product to the, this particular market, say the smaller medium enterprise segment of the market. That's my problem. That's not a good problem to start. <laughs> the problem is what is this smaller medium enterprise segment in need of? What do they need? What is the problem that you have to solve for them? So it needs to be really customer centric as a problem. I'm sure you've heard about design thinking and you know, design empathy and, and, and customer empathy. But um, that's really the first thing. So you need to find what is that inefficiency today in the market. And let's be honest, it's very difficult to find something that has never been addressed before. I mean, most of the time, when you identify a problem, there is a solution or there are multiple solutions. But those solutions often are not ideal. They're not super efficient. So how is that issue addressed today? Now we're getting into the first question of my what. How is it done today? So um, if I give you a, an example, uh, well, at the moment I'm advising a startup uh, and what they're doing is super interesting, by the way. They're doing, uh, it's, it's in the travel industry, which is in a lot of trouble, as you can imagine. Uh, but these guys are not in trouble because they're doing something smart. Uh, what they're doing is they have a, um, uh, an, a mobile app which allows you when you travel to a destination, new city that you're visiting as a, as a tourist, uh, it gives you uh, something to do. And the something to do is a game. It's gamified. So it's a quest. Uh, and by the way, if you're interested, you can look. It's called Questo and you can download it from Questo app. Q-U-E-S-T-O-A-P-P. Questoapp.com. And uh, so, so the example of the, the, uh, the issue they're addressing is that uh, today when people are traveling to a new place, um, they are interested in doing something, visiting the points of interest, you know, taking a tour, et cetera, et cetera. However, uh, the problem when you do that is that number one, it's quite expensive. Number two, you need to book in advance. And number three, it's at a given time. And number four, it's not very personalized. You're going to see the main points of attraction, right? So all of these are, you know, it's not like there's no solution today for someone who's visiting a new city. There are many things that they can do, but none of that is perfect. And they've thought about something that you can do when you want it, on your own, less expensive, a lot of fun, and it's very personalized. So it's designed, it, it will be designed according to your particular interests. So that's a cool application, that's a cool example of, um, you know, it's a problem that has a solution, but none of the existing solutions are great. So you need to find something that is better, more efficient, um, more customized, better, better tuned for the network today. Um, another question, and I, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this particular slide, but another question that, um, uh, I like to ask is um, how, or I'd like to try and assess entrepreneurs is how do they face adversity? How do they face problems? Do they get discouraged? Do they give up? Uh, do they have stamina? Do they persist? Um, can they pivot? And that is difficult to assess when you're speaking to people. You really have to look at what they've done in the past and how they have responded to challenges. And, and you know hardships effectively, e even in their personal lives. And this is why uh, VCs like to invest in repeat entrepreneurs, people that they have already had a success with in the past because they have had time to observe how these people face adversity. And that's a major point for VCs when they invest in people because make no mistake, they invest in people. They don't invest in technology so much. Yes, okay, occasionally if you have a really, really, really unique technology, a patented thing that no one else has, they might be interested, that's kind of deep tech. But that's 
today it's maybe one to five percent of the case the rest of the cases it's a group of smart guys that have a good idea about solving a problem that doesn't have a good solution today but they need to be sure that that group of smart people is also a group of persistent people that will be able to punch through the obstacles because they will be obstacles and that are able to pivot if need be so that they find another way of doing it or doing it in a slightly different way so that's my list. You can use it later if you want. As an entrepreneur, you can use it as a bit of a checklist. Can you answer all these questions? And, and if you become a VC, you can use it as a, you know, I need to check that this is a good investment for me. All right, next. So let me tell you how I did this. And, and remember, and I, I explained my, uh, how I got to Silicon Valley. I am a corporate guy. I was a corporate guy. I was sent by a large corporate. And the real question and what my talk is about is probably more about how corporates behave in Silicon Valley. Because you will hear a lot about entrepreneurs, you will hear a lot about VCs, you will hear a lot about consultants. But how do these large corporates in Silicon Valley organize themselves to do something with the startups? Because it's notoriously difficult. Large companies, small startups, how do they mix? How do they get to work with one another? You know, I call it, I use an electronic <laughs> term. I say it's an impedance mismatch. You know, you don't have the same impedance on the same side. So you need a transmission belt or a capacitor between the two to change the impedance of the, uh, of the mix. So this is my transmission belt that you see on this screen. Um, this is what I built over a period of 10 years approximately in order to make sure that BT as a large corporate based in the UK was able to take some good ideas from Silicon Valley and bring them to market in the UK and elsewhere. And it's actually not that easy. And this particular process is the reason why I'm teaching in universities now, because uh, INSEAD and Harvard Business School wrote cases on this particular process that you see on the screen. And it's being taught in multiple universities worldwide. It's considered one of the good mechanisms for um, taking an idea from a startup and getting the power and the muscle of a large corporate to bring it to market. So the first thing I had was this global scouting team and uh, that team was based here in Silicon Valley, but I also had a couple of guys in Europe, in Israel and in Asia. So we covered more than Silicon Valley. We tried to sniff some of the good entrepreneur ideas everywhere on the planet. And um, it was very useful. We, as I said, we, we had between four and 500 new startups per year throughout my team. My team of scouting was six, seven people uh, with some people traveling to different places. So it was not a lot of people and it's a lot of cases to look at. So we had, it's a numbers game. You see as many people as you can and you try and form an opinion quickly as to whether this is something that can be useful for the company, for BT to bring a new product to market or to become more efficient at what they do. The second part, which is called articulation here, is a team that I created at the headquarters back in London where the main headquarters of the company was, a team of about 10 people, between six and 10 people, and they were MBA type people, and they call them my analysts. Um, and uh, these analysts were able to convert the pitch of the startup into language that was comprehensible by the company, by the executives of the company and by the operational guys in the company. Because there's a language problem. You always work as a translator between the language of Silicon Valley and the language of the corporate world in your country. So that's my translation team, articulation I call it, because they helped me create a PowerPoint, an Excel spreadsheet to explain why it was a good idea to work with this startup. And the next one is probably the most important one. It's the experimenting team, experimentation. So this is what large corporates are very bad at because the, the normal behavior in a large corporate is to, you know, they want to do something perfect. So when they create a new product, uh, they work on it for two years and they perfect everything and they cross the T's and they dot the I's and it's shiny and beautiful. It arrives in the market two years later and it's too late because in two years the market has moved on. 
So that is quite challenging for large corporates. What large corporates need to do is to experiment fast. And that fast experimentation, for those of you who have become accustomed to the principle of lean and who have read the book from Eric Ries, The Lean Startup, that is the main idea. Fast experimentation, being able to test things in the market, even if it's not perfect, if it, even if it's not just an MVP. That's something that large corporates don't do well. And that is something that I learned from Silicon Valley and I imported into the company to make sure that we could do fast experimentation. And that was, if I think about my entire career, that it's the one thing that was the most important for me, knowing how to create an experiment that would prove a point very, very fast and very frugally, that it wouldn't cost a lot of money, very affordable. You know, I would pay for a, 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 an experiment that lasted hmm, between, let's, see, let's get eight, no, four and 12 weeks, approximately on average eight weeks. Um, that would cost me anywhere between $50,000 and maximum $100,000, sometimes less than that. So it was low cost experience. We're not talking about millions of dollars of product development here. Super important, that team in the middle. That was the biggest team, by the way. Uh, my entire team was about 60 people to convert startups into the mainstream of the company. So it's a fairly large team, but that was the biggest team. They had about 20 people doing those experiments. Then I had another team that I call storytelling because we like to, once we have the experiments and we have these prototypes that we've created and these MVPs that we have created, we put them on a display, uh, an innovation showcase display, uh, which was co-located with our labs. And we took customers to see this. Every day we had a group of executives from a large customer and we showed them we had about 260 of these prototypes, um, and, but we grouped them by industry. So we have a bank of the future, a hospital of the future, a home of the future. And we show them the things that are relevant to them. We show them, you know, not 260, we showed them five, six or seven. And then we sit down with them and we listen to what they have to say. And that storytelling function, that showing it to customers, getting the feedback from customers very quickly, that was super important. Second most important after, after experimenting. So that's the other, the, the other function that I built at BT. And finally, when we had something that we knew customers wanted, we had the voice of the customer, we had the right experiment, we knew we wanted to go ahead, then the fastest way to get the software engineering and network engineering teams to work on it is not to write a 30 page specifications document, which was the way they did it before. It's to create a three day hothouse. And that hothouse was again, a prototyping hothouse where we use the MVP and we put the, 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 the scale engineering teams in front of that MVP and we said, how are you gonna build it now? And they had three days to this design, how they're gonna build it and scale it inside the company. So that's the process that I built at BT and some people are still very interested in applying that process. And uh, you know, if, if you guys come across large corporates and they are asking themselves, how could they go about using open innovation and transforming that into market success. I mean, you can read some of the cases there or you can ping me and I'll, I'll give you more details about that. Before we get onto this one, I'm going to pause for a minute because we might have, um, we might have a few questions and then I'll do the second part of the, of the presentation. But let me give you a time to breathe a little bit because I've been saying a lot of things already. You might have questions. So let me see if there are any questions. Let me open the Q&A. Uh, oh, could I repeat the name of the Quest? So it's Questo app, Q, U. In fact, I'm gonna type it if I can. It's, in the... it's already in the chat, guys. Thank okay. you, Sergei, for posting it in the chat. Yeah, yeah, it's a cool company. It's a company from uh, Romania, by the way. Uh, the founders are Romanian and uh, wow. very, very smart cookies. So um, they're, uh, they're doing something really good. And if you get into a, a city and you don't know what to do with your time, check out Questo app <laughs> and it will, nice. give you a, it will give you a bit of a, a treasure hunt to do in that city and you'll discover the points of interest and uh, it will be fun. And uh, you, it's all walking towards, by the way, you don't have to ride any, any, any vehicles for that. Nice. Guys, if you have any questions right now, it's your time to post it in the Q&A section. That's where we're looking at your questions. 
Uh, I would say there was a couple questions about um, IP, and this question comes up a lot because it's a huge part, especially working with corporations. So you as a small, tiny startup, how do you protect your IP, uh, getting investment from a bigger company? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, especially when you're working with large companies. Um, in, the, in Silicon Valley, I'll just tell you a little dirty secret. Okay? In Silicon Valley, people don't really care about IP, <laughs> much less so than in the rest of the world. Uh, the rest of the world is completely fanatic about protection. Um, it's particularly true in Asia. And you know, people say a lot about how China you know, does many things with the intellectual property. But the reality of it is, if you try and work with anybody in Japan, in Korea, in Southeast Asia, IP comes at the front of the mindset of everybody every time. Here in Silicon Valley, eh, not so much. The reason is that people think that if you have a really good idea, and if you have a really good execution team, it's mainly a question of speed and execution. It's not so much a question of protecting that idea because it's unprotectable over the long term anyway. Uh, a good idea will end up in the hands of everyone. And what you have to become really good at is executing on that idea. So that's the um, mindset of Silicon Valley, if you like. That explains why IP is not as important in Silicon Valley. In fact, an example, if you speak to VCs, and you hand out to them a, you know, can you sign my NDA before we speak? You'll be very surprised because no one will sign your NDA, right? The VCs do not sign NDAs. And that's an example of the mindset of Silicon Valley where there's a lot of conversations about everything. And it is somewhat promiscuous. I mean, with one exception, the Apple guys never participate in those conversations. Yeah, they're <laughs> yeah, outside of this about. game. <laughs> Secret squirrel guys. But the rest of Silicon Valley is very promiscuous in the right sense of that term. It's also the reason why there are so many cross fertilization of ideas in Silicon Valley. You sit down, you know, uh, University Cafe on University of in Palo Alto, and you will hear conversations around you in the three tables around you about entrepreneurs or new ideas about this, new ideas about that. And you can join that conversation. You can say, hey, I've got an idea about that. <laughs> and no one will reject you. And so, it's a little bit of a different mindset. Now, having said that, my role as a corporate guy in charge of innovation for BT was to protect the entrepreneurs from BT. Because, and that's not just BT. I mean, I, I had the example yesterday, I was speaking with a large European electric equipment company. And the number one problem they had, or that we worked on in this particular workshop was what happens if, a startup shows me a new product. I decide not to invest and not to do anything. But guess what? My internal teams inside the company decide to do something similar by accident or you know, serendipity. And so that, that is a real question. So when you work, and that also is a reason why people are a little bit more careful with corporate venture capital compared to venture capital. The VC guys will never do that. They will never... Um, abuse an idea because if they do that, their reputation is over, right? So, and the word get, gets around very quickly in Silicon Valley. If a VC does something like that to a startup and abuses their intellectual property by propagating it in a place where it gets abused, then that VC will never get any good business anymore. So they're very careful. But corporate venture guys, the problem is that it's a large corporation. You present a startup in a meeting, there's 20 people listening. God knows what's going to happen to that idea in that, in that company, right? So my job was to protect the, the startups from this problem. And what I did about that was I got internal NDAs. So I got people when they sat into the presentation, the pitches from a startup, which, was, which had something that was very unique. I got them to sign an internal NDA, a personal NDA, where they personally were held responsible and liable if that idea was being abused sometime in the company. So it's a real question. And um, even though Silicon Valley is a bit more flexible around that, when you work with corporates, you really have to be careful. Okay. And just to follow on question to that subject, um, from uh, here comes from, uh, the question comes from Alexei. He's asking that um, our colleagues were giving a talk that 75% of the value of the startup in the USA, it's its patents. How true is that? Very untrue. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> it's not at all about the patents. 
No, no, no. I mean, the patents are important. Don't take yes. me wrong. I mean, if execution. You have, if you have a hard core tech startup, then of course the patents are important. You want to have something that's defensible. But the reality of it is the majority of the uh, value of the company is in the team and how quickly you're able to address the market and how efficient you are doing it. And this is the other thing that VCs like to test with you. Are you that team that's going to be able to punch through that market super quickly, pivot when needed, experiment the right way, spend money frugally, and, and face adversity if it happens? That's what they want to test. So in fact, it's a little bit, the, in the old times, 20 years ago when I arrived here, it was very much a question of IP, right? And it was very much a question of IP in domains like, uh, you know, network, uh, optical networking, for instance, was a hot subject where- Microchips. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Anything that has to do with hardware, you know, electric, you know microelectronics hardware or super sharp end hardware, Yes, in that case, the IP is super important. But let's be honest. Today, the world of Silicon Valley revolves around software, mostly. Okay, so and in software, nothing's really protectable, to be honest. So it's less of a challenge today, and that IP question is of a diminishing importance every day. So it's more about can you execute fast, and do you have the skills to do that? And that's what VCs like to assess. Thank you. Okay, let, let's move on to the next part. I'm going to give you a couple of fun things to think about. So this is, <coughs> sorry, this is what I, uh, how I like to describe Silicon Valley and who the players are in Silicon Valley. And you see, I call this my Silicon Valley happy family. So the family has babies and the babies are the startups. Uh, and when you get into Silicon Valley as an entrepreneur with a startup, you get into the mix of babies and, you know, you crawl, you know, around the ground here and you meet other people like you, other entrepreneurs and other teams. And, and you speak to a lot of guys in that straight there, in that strat of babies. Now, the next layer up is what I call the teenagers. Now, they're the guys and, and these names here, you might find they're a little bit bigger than teenagers, some of them for sure. I mean, LinkedIn's been acquired by Microsoft. Facebook is one of the big fangs. But you know what I mean. I mean, they're the, um, the unicorns or the wannabe unicorns. I mean, they're the, the people that are coming up to unicorn status. Um, and uh, they're really interesting because they have grown to a, to a scale. Remember my slide about scale-ups? These guys are more than 200 people. I mean, they're typically, you know, maybe in 1,000 people. And they've got a different way of working now because it's not five people in a garage, it's not 20 people in a small office, it's a larger number of people and they remain, they still need to remain innovative. So for corporates, for BT, for me, for instance, it was very interesting to look at this particular set of teenagers to understand how they remain innovative at scale. That was the lesson for me from them. But for an entrepreneur and for a startup, it's super interesting to see how they've moved from startup to scale up. So you absolutely have to find friends in these companies and mingle with these guys and understand from the inside how they came to scale. The next layer is what I call the uncles and aunts. They're the people that are the oils in the wheel, the oil in the wheels of the valley. They're, they're the ones that make things happen. Again, we talked about VCs a lot already. You, you know, I told you what they do and what they don't do. They act as the human resource group for the for Silicon Valley. But there's the incubators, you know, like plug and play, and you know, there's plenty of those. There's the universities, of course. There's the um, uh, Wilson Sonsini is, is a big law firm. And these are all the people that connect people. They make things happen. They create the serendipity in Silicon Valley. They, they find ways to, uh, you know, get a good project and a good person to meet uh, at the right time. So these are very important people. And again, my advice for people coming into Silicon Valley is to also get to know some of these people, not just by doing a pitch, but if possible, socially. Because again, I mean, Silicon Valley is a place where socially a lot of things happen. You can meet people at barbecues, you can meet people you know, with friends. 
and you need to get under the skin of these uh, these companies. And then you have the parents, and in the parents, of course, you have the big fans, you have the big investors, the Apples and the Microsoft and the Amazon. And forgive me, Microsoft and Amazon are not really physically in Silicon Valley. Yes, they're in Seattle, uh, but they have big presence now in Silicon Valley. And the Googles and the Salesforce and the Facebooks are, you know, are definitely in, the, in this category. These guys are super important because they will probably, if you're doing something good in software, they'll probably be your exit or they will probably become interested in you. If, they, if you are on their radar and they become interested in you, your valuation will go the way you want it to go. And, and there might be a good, a good surprise at the end, right? So you need to find your way to mingle with these people. And there is no book written about how you do that. It's your personal skills that will get you in those circles. And then I normally insult someone in the audience by saying, Oh, there's the grandparents of there, you know, the GEs, the HPs, the AT&Ts and the Oracles and the SAPs. And these are the, it's the older wave of people and they're interesting, but they're not that interesting anymore. And perhaps a small exception for Intel because they still have a very active corporate venture firm. But in general, I would say don't waste too much time with these guys. Uh, again, these are the large old, um, you know, US or not necessarily old US corporates. And they're not really part of the action in Silicon Valley that much. I mean, they, 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 you risk wasting a lot of time with these people because they get you into their labs and they don't let you work. Okay, so that's my slide about the happy family of Silicon Valley and where you want to go as a baby getting into the system. Get up the, uh, the ladder, but don't uh, waste time with the grandparents too much. Now, here is another thing about Silicon Valley. You know, I told you that you could sit at the cafe on University Avenue in Palo Alto and participate in three different conversations. Well, this will happen to you all the time when you're in Silicon Valley, physically present, I mean, which today is a bit of a challenge. But, you know, you need to have some opinion, something to say that is smart about everything, because this is how people judge you. Uh, you know, they, you need to be part of the discussions about trends, about... Um, you know, what is the newest thing that's happening? I mean, yesterday was the Apple announcement, so you need to have something to say about the Apple announcements. Um, but, you know, these are four subjects that are absolutely essential to not completely master, but you need to form a, an opinion about these things. What about AI? What about machine learning? Particularly, what about computer vision, which is such a hot subject at the moment? Um, then there's the immersive technology, right? So AR and VR or mixed reality, as we call it, this is becoming such an important trend today because of COVID and because of people staying at home and doing things like we're doing now. Um, what we're doing now is a bit flat. It's not immersive. You see my picture flat. But if we were all avatars or if you could see me in 3D and we were all in a single room like that, our avatars would be all in a single room and we would look like uh, proper, you know, uh, like Princess Leia in Star Wars, where it's um, a mini hologram, that would be more fun, right? So th there's a lot of work on that subject at the moment for business, but also for commerce and also for gaming and entertainment, goes without saying. And then there's the 5G and Edge stuff and distributed apps in general. Um, I mean, the cloud subject has moved from, uh, you know, monolithic, um, you know, virtualization subject to uh, uh, microservices um, and, and now, you know, some serverless architectures, which is going more and more granular. Uh, but it, what's interesting is it's becoming more and more distributed because you have the main cloud and, and you have endpoint devices where you run a part of the applications. I mean, these, these guys are so much more powerful now. Um, so you can run apps in there and there's you know, uh, ways to make sure that it doesn't use the battery in, in an hour. But there's something in the middle, which is becoming very interesting, which is the um, uh, edge computing. And edge computing is something that I would urge you to pay attention to because it's coming with 5G, with the fifth generation mobile. So you need to understand that. And when you discuss you know, your software architecture, you need to have opinions about uh, how this whole thing is going to work together, how it's going to be orchestrated, how it's going to be optimized. Uh, these are the sort of discussions you're expecting to have in Silicon Valley. And then finally, and it's not the end of the list because you have other things like uh, quantum computing and, and many other subjects, but you need to have something to say about blockchain. 
<laughs> and what I call the internet of value, right? So that is quite, quite important to um, have an opinion about it, uh, not just the cryptocurrencies, um, but, you know, in general, what's happening in the internet of value. So, and that's just my advice, right? Because, uh, you know, as, as a newcomer in 2000, I mean, these were not the right subject at the time, but it was very often that I find myself in those conversations in order to be accepted by the fabric of Silicon Valley, you need to play the game. You need to be in the know. You need to be a bit of a, an ultra geek on multiple subjects. I mean, people really value geekiness here. They value technical competence and opinions about technical things. So that's my personal advice about how to make your way into Silicon Valley from a social perspective. Okay, um, I'll finish with maybe one or two slides which are all about practical advice and this is practical advice if you're going to try and knock on the door of a large corporate. Uh, you're a startup, you're an entrepreneur, you come into Silicon Valley, and you need customers because this is how you're going to get funding. And maybe you already got customers in your uh, original country. It could be you know, Eastern Europe, or it could be Europe, or it could be elsewhere. But you're going to need some of these U.S. customers as well. And in order to get them, my advice is put yourself in the shoes of the corporate guy who's going to be listening to your pitch. Not the same as a VC, right? A corporate guy listening to your pitch is already half scared. Because remember, corporate people are not promoted for taking risks. They're promoted for delivering results without risk with maximum uh, predictability, right? So that's what they get promoted for. People who take risks in large corporations Mm, it doesn't always go well for them, right? So you have to be understanding of that. Now, the other thing is that in Silicon Valley, the corporate guys that mingle around with the entrepreneurs and people like me when I was at BT, they do not have the big checkbook. They're not the ones that are going to place the contract with you. They're the ones that I recommend someone places the contract with you. And they might have a little bit of money to do a POC, but not much more than that. So don't mistake the people that are mingling in Silicon Valley, there are in innovation teams. And a lot of these people are actually time wasters because they don't have a lot of traction with their headquarters. You know, they're considered outcasts out there in Silicon Valley. They don't speak the same language of the, the mothership anymore. I don't know what they're doing in Silicon Valley. They let them be and then three years later, they cut the funding. So you need to be really careful about that. You need to be careful about speaking to the people that have connections back at the headquarters. I showed you my transmission belt. You need to do your own diligence on the corporations and find out if they have a process to get you into the right place in the company, not just waste your time with you know, half a dozen guys in Silicon Valley that have no connections with the rest of the business. Now, once you do get in connect, connected with the rest of the business, you need to make their life easy. And their life is complicated because their life is always how am I going to get something new into the operational teams, into the architecture teams, whether it's software or network, or there's always architecture somewhere, into the security team. Security in large companies is the major disabler for innovation, as we all know, um, for a good cause, of course, but it's a major disabler, so it slows down innovation enormously. You need to have a response to that. You need to be able to phone the, the security guy from the corporate and say, yep, we're no risk because A, B, and C. And then you have the, the other side of it, which is channels. How is that corporate going to sell my technology? Maybe they're not selling it into the right customers at the moment. How are they going to do with customer service? Uh, you know, how are they going to service the customers with my technology? Is it going to cost them an arm and a leg? All of that is complicated for the guy who's going to champion your case in a corporation. So you need to help that person and uh, design a plan or have responses to all these questions. And finally, when it comes to POCs, remember one thing, do not do free POCs. I mean, by all means, try and avoid them uh, because free POCs are uh, time wasting. I mean, basically there's no commitment from the corporate. And so they're just humoring you and they're just letting you spend your resource on things that they might or might not have an interest because they're not spending any money on it anyway. So if you do a free POC, you have to be really convinced that it's for a good reason. Because my rule of thumb is avoid free POCs. Propose a plan which has a very clear POC uh, alignment where you have the resource you're going to put together, the time scales in which it's going to be ex executed, uh, what are the acceptance criteria, when is it a success versus not a success, and a price for it. 
So if you propose that clearly from the start, it helps a great deal. Don't expect the guys in the corporate to be good at writing a plan like that. They're not that good at writing plans like that. So that's my very practical advice if you're knocking on the door of corporates. Okay, I'm gonna skip that because I wanna give a bit more time for uh, questions. This is These two slides, you can look them up. They're, that's the impact of what's happening post COVID in Silicon Valley. And we can talk about that if you have Q&A. We, we can continue the conversation on email if you have questions about that. Um, and that's the summary of everything I've said. So I, I, you, know, you can read that, but uh, I will uh, reopen for a couple more questions. And Anastasia, if you've seen any, now would be a, a good time. We've got like five minutes left. Yes, guys, let's be, if you want to add your question, put it in a Q&A section right now. We have a couple good questions. So uh, you mentioned that COVID kind of reshifted a little bit the area, but obviously Silicon Valley is not disappearing. So would you say our founders from Russia still have to go to Silicon Valley for raising capital or do they have a chance doing it from Russia? Okay, so and that's a really, really, really good question and topical question. So my advice is don't rush. Don't rush into Silicon Valley today because what we're doing here on Zoom that is the new modus operandi for most of the VCs and most of the incubators. So everybody who is going to be your first point of connection into Silicon Valley, they're very happy to take Zoom calls now. And these Zoom calls can be short or long. You can do a lot of, you can do a lot with a, in, a, in a Zoom call or in a, in a different type of, of distance interaction. But distance interactions have become the norm since February in Silicon Valley. Um, in fact, this place is more careful about the virus than the rest of the U.S., right? So people That's are much true. more minded to, uh, to be careful and not to propagate the virus. So they're very happy to do that. Now, that is for your first contact. At some point, if things get really interesting, if you go through the diligence, if you go through uh, when things become really serious and people are about to invest or you feel that there's really an investment intention, you will need to meet people face to face because there's no way people can give you millions of dollars without having seen your face and shaken your hands and you know seen the flesh and bones. So that will become essential. But don't, what I'm saying is, don't you have a, always have a big funnel, right? I mean, this is big numbers of meetings, and then it shrinks down to one or two or three really interesting ones. That's the time that you go to Silicon Valley, but not at the beginning where you start running around like a headless chicken and meet 20 people. People are not going to want to meet with you anyway. So do it via Zoom in the first instance. And if it gets serious, then consider going to Silicon Valley. Um, that's my advice at the moment, because that's a new modus operandi of the Valley. And all the VCs I speak to, they're all happy with that. But when it comes to actually making that investment, there's very few that have actually made the investment without seeing the person. The case when they do that is if it's people they've worked with before. Right? So if it's repeat entrepreneurs and they've had two successes with that team before, yep, they will give you that money, you know, the check right away, even if they haven't uh, you know, met you physically this time because they've met you before. Or I also would like to add that if it's an earlier stage company, if it's not millions of dollars, if it's a seed round or maybe an angel round, uh, I know a few investors who made investments online. Uh, but it took them 10, 15 calls, series of interviews, personal assessment, due diligence. So it will be a process. Yep, and, and, and that process is entirely feasible. Uh, the data is important. And as you rightly said, Anastasia, I mean, part of the diligence is to speak to customers. So if you have existing customers and you're knocking on the door of Silicon Valley, be aware that people will want to speak to your customers. They will want to interview them quite in depth, um, you know, your new customers and your historical customers. So um, that, that's quite a process. So people need to be uh, ready with that. But the good news, you know, about Silicon Valley at the moment is that it's opening to a lot of potential investors. I mean, when I arrived here in 2000, there was a, um, a saying in Silicon Valley, no VC would invest more than 20 miles away from 101 and 280, which are yes. the, two, the two highways that are going north-south in Silicon Valley. And this means very, very locally because they wanted to be physically present to attend board meetings and they wanted to drive the company. VCs are very hands-on. I mean, they like to 
differentiate themselves by what they call smart money, which means helping the entrepreneurs, not just giving them money, opening the doors for them, participating in board meetings, giving them advice every day, blah, blah, blah. So they would only do that locally. But today, with COVID, they're actually opening the floodgates. And someone who's not local gets airtime as long as they have a good story, right? So, uh, you know, for instance, every Friday I sit with Plug and Play, they have a pitch day. And that pitch day six months ago or a year ago, it was mostly local companies, right? I mean, you could see, you know, American guys getting on the stage and pitching 20 of them four minute increment. Now, uh, Friday, it's South America, it's Eastern Europe, it's Russia. I mean, that, that company that I talked about, which is from uh, uh, Budapest, no, Bucharest, sorry, uh, Romania. They, they absolutely uh, came in through uh, the floodgates like that. I mean, they are uh, getting into Silicon Valley that way. So, um, so you have more chances today because geography doesn't count as long as you can work at night <laughs> and, and have calls, uh, you know, in time shifted ways. I mean, I, I take calls at, uh, you know, I have a, a Beijing session next week, which is between wow. midnight and 4 a.m. So that's okay. You have to be prepared to do that. But um, it's entirely possible, entirely possible. And I would recommend also you don't stop to Silicon Valley. You also do things outside of Silicon Valley. You hand for capital everywhere where you need it. And don't forget Singapore. Uh, don't forget um, you know, Northeast Asia. Uh, the Japanese are really interesting at the moment because they know they're very far behind in digital transformation. They have to catch up. So it's an interesting market. There's more and more you know, VC uh, capital there. Um, I'd say be a little bit careful with China. Uh, oh yeah, and not necessarily. That's where you should care about your IP. Yeah, well, not just about intellectual property, but also uh, you know access to capital in China. The reality of the checks arriving in the right currency. Uh, there's a lot of talk, and sometimes people are disappointed. So um, be careful. Uh, Jean-Marc, I know we're at past ten. Do you have another couple of minutes for the last question, or we have oh. to let you go? Okay, the last question will be regarding being uh, bulletproof for the next uh, dot com, not dot com, but the next bubble burst. How to identify that you're building a startup in the industry that might collapse in the next, um, in the next bubble? Um, so, I mean, so that's really uh, interesting. You should not worry about that. You should not worry about collapsing in the next bubble. Um, clearly, uh, the way you manage your finance is super important. So uh, the way you manage your financial runway and how much dry powder you keep in the bank is super important. If possible, always raise money ahead of time. Don't wait until the last minute and always have at least a year of runway ahead of you. That's the ideal. I mean, if you go to nine months or six months, that's the minimum. Um, so that, that's, that's one thing that is purely financial. But the main thing is when the crisis arrives, you need to have the stamina to sustain your business and remain focused even for a year without customers. You need to still keep the, the, you know, the, the mindset of a winner. And that's super difficult. But there are multiple things that you can do. And one of the things that you need to do is be very good. When a crisis arrives, you need to renegotiate everything. You re need to renegotiate with your suppliers. You need to renegotiate with your customers. You negotiate everything from pricing to payment plans, everything. So that's the first one because you need to conserve cash at that point. And the second thing is communications and crisis management, internal and external communication. If you're already fairly transparent with your activities, you need to double up on transparency, on transparency of what you do with your investors first. You need to create a new plan when, the, when a crisis strikes. You need to have a crisis plan. You need to say, okay, that money that I had, this is how I'm, how I'm going to spend it now. And this is what I've done with my supplies and with my customers. You give your investors confidence that you have a plan, that you're doing it. That plan you also discuss internally. You create your crisis team with three, four, five people maximum that you meet every day to manage the crisis. And you, dis and you are completely transparent about the state of the company with everyone in the company, all the employees of the company. These are super important things to do and people, it, so it's not about being prepared now, it's more about having the right mindset when it arrives, the mindset of renegotiation, the mindset of transparency, 
the mindset of having a, a plan that can change every every month as long as you're transparent and you communicate it properly and that will get you through anything he right says. that agile agile approach and as you said thank you so much for this answer i remember in the beginning of this year when COVID hit um and we were raising capital for some of the companies and i was talking to venture partners and they're like we're sorry but we're busy we're working with our portfolio companies on the crisis plan exactly. so it's not the f they're not going to pull out money right away or cut the checks nothing is like that happening it's all about being strategic it's about being prepared and having an answer to complicated questions jean marc exactly. thank you so much you're very welcome. I hope this was somewhat useful. Please don't hesitate to ping me. Let me just show you on my slide if I'm still showing this. This is my email address for those of you who might need to speak to me about anything or Anastasia knows where to find me. So it's- uh, I'm making a screenshot myself. I will definitely reach out. Your insights uh, across VC, CVC, uh, Silicon Valley are extremely valuable and I can't express how grateful uh, we are and I am personally for your talk today. Well, it's fantastic. I really enjoyed the, the chat with you and the interactions with the previous groups and hopefully this one. So uh, all of this is going into the right direction. Keep up the good work and uh, we hope to see you soon virtually or physically in Silicon Valley.